the time. So, well, hold on. He's gonna poop on the floor. No, I guess not. He will eventually poop on the floor. Anyone know who this is? Someone said Sparrowhawk, yeah! We used to call her the Sparrowhawk. Spit it out, but maybe I learned that lesson with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> that just because it tastes bad, maybe it's good for you. So what if I decide I'm going to eat him anyway? I ate him, all his toad poison and all. What's going to happen? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to die. I'm a big mammal. I can soak up a lot of poison. That's actually a cool thing about being a big mammal. Like, how many of you guys have ever eaten McDonald's? And you're fine. You're running out of poison. <laughs> but that poison isn't going to kill me, but it's probably going to make me sick. Like this lady said over here, I'm probably going to throw up. Did that save him? No, I chewed him up and ate him. But tomorrow, when I'm starting to feel a little better, maybe I'm getting my appetite back, I run across his cousin Ed. Am I going to eat that toad? Yeah. And those animals out there, they know. Toads taste bad, they make you sick, don't eat them. There's one group of animals, though, that it doesn't make them sick. There's some snakes that'll gobble toads right up. And that's why he's doing this other thing. You see how he kind of looks like a balloon? I mean, toads are stocky, you know? Toads are not the mean athletes our frogs are. Um, but he's inflated now. Because when a snake eats its food, how does it do? You guys know? Swallows it whole, yeah. And if this toad can blow up, that snake might look at him and go, man, nah, too big to swallow. And move on down the road. The toad's safe. Or if the snake's trying to swallow the toad, he can inflate up big enough, the snake might spit him out. Uh, Vermont just got a real serious toad-eating snake over in southeastern Vermont, down near Vernon, Guilford. Um, the eastern hognose snake has come north, and they're in Vermont now. And they are a toad eater. Our toads are not looking forward to meeting that guy. Did they really get a good enough look at toads? Yeah. How many of you guys ever seen a toad before? Did you know about all their awesome defenses? Did you know that in the winter, this guy can dig a tunnel nine feet long? Yeah. They dig down to get underneath the cross so they won't freeze. He can't survive freezing. So they'll dig these crazy tunnels. Um, and they dig them backwards. They just go with their feet, like they're wiping their feet, and down they go, whoop, right out of sight. Pretty neat stuff. Um, let's see somebody a little more visible than a toad. Probably the most accessible wildlife around behind birds. Here's a bird. Now, unfortunately, we're not allowed to pet the birds. We do have a couple animals we're going to be able to pet today, though, guys. Don't worry. Um, so this little bird, we got some nature folks in the room. Anyone know who this is? Someone said Sparrowhawk, yeah. We used to call her the Sparrow. If you're looking her up in the bird books, um, you're going to want to look for American Kestrel. But yeah, Sparrowhawk is another name for this bird. She is a falcon. We can recognize falcons in North America by their racing stripes. Okay, you see those dark stripes that go down across their eyes? All of our falcons have those, those up and down stripes. We have some other hawks that kind of wear a mask. But the falcons have those vertical, those up and down stripes. We actually stole that from a falcon. If we're playing uh, in the outfield or football players, you guys ever notice they put that dark stuff under their eyes? Do you know why we do that? To cut the glare. To cut the glare, yeah. Because you're out in the sun, you're out in that wide open space, the sun can get in your eyes, that little bit of dark under your eyes will help you. The falcons did it first. Those dark feathers under her eyes help cut the glare. Um, falcons, like hawks and eagles, depend on their eyesight to find their food. Her vision is about five or six times sharper than yours or mine. That lets her spot a grasshopper 100 yards away. Think about that. We can go down to the school. You guys have a soccer field in your school, right? We can all imagine a soccer field. She can play goalie for our team down here. She can look all the way down the other end of that field and see a grasshopper playing goalie for the other team. Super eyesight. Kestrels can also 
galaxy ultraviolet light. So they see light we can't see. Weird, right? That sounds strange. Try imagining some new colors. Don't like mix orange and blue. I mean like new colors. Don't try too hard, you'll hurt you. But, uh, so this is a bird that, in a lot of Vermont, they've become less common. Uh, they really want open spaces. So most of Vermont, especially if we look at the last 100, 150 years, uh, has gone from field to forest. And that's the wrong home for her. She wants wide open spaces. Uh, we get out into the Champlain Valley, or up in the Champlain Valley, we get to some more agricultural areas. We have a lot of kestrels. You might also see them along the highway. Uh, in the Northeast Kingdom now, their numbers are going up because there's an increase in logging in the Northeast Kingdom. Kestrels love that. I mean, if you get a chainsaw, you're a kestrel's best friend. You know, we often hear about how deforestation is bad, and it is if you're a forest animal. If you're an open country animal, it's great. She loves it if you cut these things down. Um, now, this kestrel and all of the animals we have in the museum, I should tell you, uh, is they are with us for a reason. Uh, any animals we have that can survive in the wild, we don't have. They go to the wild. This kestrel uh, is a bird that has a permanent handicap. And for the rest of our birds of prey, eagles, ravens, everybody, uh, their handicaps are physical. Most of them are hit by cars. She was not hit by a car. She didn't fly into a power line. Nobody took a shot at her. She has a really strange handicap, though. Does anybody, have you guys, any of you guys ever met her before? She gets around quite a bit. You have? Yeah, I thought you guys looked familiar. Do you remember what's wrong with her? You're right. Yes, he remembers. She has mental problems. Uh oh. She's like yeah. all those women, huh? What? She's like both women, huh? Oh, uh, well. I would never say no. Uh, so, this little bird, when she was just a baby, uh, some, someone got a hold of her. And we don't know the details. Maybe the tree came down, and they went, oh no, baby Kestrel, we've got to save it. Maybe in the middle of the night, they climbed up that tree and they snatched the baby. We don't know. We have no idea. Uh, but we do know she wasn't two weeks old yet. Because right around day 13, a Kestrel looks up and says, hey, thanks for those grasshoppers. He must be my mom. And it locks into her little brain that this thing feeding her is her mother. It's called imprinting. You guys probably heard about that with like chickens, right? Yeah. A chicken pops out of the egg, it looks around, it's big, it's moving, it's mom, and it follows that dog right across the barnyard. <laughs> uh, with those birds though, chickens, ducks, turkeys, who imprint right away, when they grow up, there comes a time where they go, <laughs> I'm a chicken. <laughs> and they go off and they be chickens. Birds that imprint when they're older, like a parrot is an awesome example of this, or a kestrel. Once they imprint, it stays with them for their entire life. She's, ten, she's over 10 years old now. She's a great, 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 great grandma kestrel. In the wild, for this bird to live six or seven years is pretty exceptional. Uh, and every spring, when her body tells her, time to lay some eggs, let's find a boyfriend, her messed up little brain starts checking you guys out. <laughs> she directs all her social behaviors towards people, uh, which I really think is the saddest handicap. You know, you're going to be an owl today that knows she's an owl. She just can't physically do what she needs to survive. He brought the other up. Um, this kestrel can physically do anything a kestrel can do. She can fly 60 miles an hour. Wow. She can hover. She can see where the mice were being with that ultraviolet light thing. But she doesn't know how to be a kestrel. If she meets a boy kestrel, he's just some little bird. And you know one of the things kestrels like to eat? Little birds. Yeah. When she starts looking for a boyfriend, she's looking at people. And no, I am not her boyfriend. She prefers long, dark hair, actually. It's what she seems to like best, which makes us think the person who raised her probably had long, dark hair. She's a visual animal, right? Um, and it's a, it is a shame. The, the bright side for us is she is absolutely fearless about you guys. She's actually happier here than she is back in her enclosure. She likes being around people. 
Well, yes, yeah, she'll flap her wings to keep her balance. Um, and that's today, that's the main reason. You know, I'm rotating my hand here to get her to open those wings. You see how long and pointed those wings are? That's another way you can recognize a falcon. Uh, a hawk or a bird of prey, big feet, sharp talons, hook shaped beak, long tail, and long pointed wings. You're looking at a falcon. All right, let's see somebody we can touch. Uh, before I bring this next guy out, though, um, I should ask, is anyone here a little nervous about snakes? No. No? Awesome. <laughs> we never hear anyone shout out no. <laughs> cool. Uh, so anybody going to admit it? It's okay. It's pretty common. No? Cool. We'll see. <laughs> so... Uh, a lot of people are nervous about snakes. You know, sometimes we're worried that they're venomous. We do have one venomous snake in Vermont. Uh, we have the timber rattlesnake. Pretty much all those guys are up between Rutland and Middlebury. Uh, we wiped rattlesnakes out in most of New England. Uh, we were afraid of them, right? We were, we were worried about those guys. So in the winter, when these rattlesnakes would all go to the same place, we'd show up with a stick of dynamite and blow them up. And it wiped them out. And it wiped out the rat snakes and the milk snakes and all the other very beneficial snakes that were crawling around out there. Now this guy is a corn snake. Uh, they're a little further south. It's a southeastern snake. He's an unwanted pet. Someone abandoned him in the middle of a parking lot. Uh, he ended up with us eventually. Very similar to our milk snake though. Uh, not only in habit, but also the way they look. If in between those spots, this snake was gray or more of a tannish color, that's pretty much what a milk snake looks like. Uh, they also live the same kind of lives. They're rodent hunters. They spend most of their time on the ground and underground. So a rodent hunter, is that handy for us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a wow. Okay. Uh, you guys want to, you want to pet him? Okay. He's a very nice snake. Uh, okay, we'll put his head in way over here. You sure? All right, you're going to do it, though. All right. The, uh, you know, people get worried about being bitten by a snake. Can I tell you guys something awesome about getting bit by a snake? They have incredibly weak jaws. If this snake were to chomp onto my ear as hard as he could, just really latch right on there, i just have a funny looking ear. We pull him off, and I can tell you guys that I've gotten too close to a raspberry bush, you'd believe me. He can't do as much damage as a rose bush can do. Uh, and that's why they swallow their food whole. They don't really have a choice. They have to swallow it whole. They can't chew. You want to pet it? They can't take a bite out of anything. You got bit by a garter snake, and you live to tell the tale. All right. No, I'm not going to chase you, man. I won't, I promise. All right. Now, uh, we should want to know, though, how to recognize that rattlesnake, right? Yeah. The tail, of course, is handy if you can see the rattles on that tail. Uh, but with all of our venomous snakes in the Northeast, and really almost all of North America, they're pretty easy to recognize. They're vipers. That means they have big diamond or triangle-shaped heads. Uh, the rest of our snakes have heads like this guy, small head. So when you see that strange snake crawling around the backyard, take a look at it. If it has a big head, probably leave that one alone. If it has a little head, probably leave it alone too. It's a wild animal. It doesn't want to be your pet. Um, but it won't be able to hurt you or your cat or anything like that. Uh, when uh, we do encounter milk snakes here, and our black rat snakes also. They do do kind of a neat trick that this corn snake also does. They will pretend to be venomous snakes. They try to flatten their head out to make their hat head look big. They'll coil right up, you know, that classic rattlesnake pose, and they'll buzz their tail. Now, they don't have rattles, but if that tail is down in the leaves or drumming against something, it sounds a lot like a rattlesnake. Uh, and a lot of these guys get killed because of that. You know, it's great defense if it's a coyote you're dealing with. The coyote's like, aha, a snake! Whoa, a rattlesnake! And off he goes. With us, we go, hey, look, a snake! Oh no, it's a rattlesnake! We run away, we get a shovel, we run back. Right, 
I mean, we, a lot of milk snakes and corn snakes down south get killed uh, because we think they're rattlesnakes. Yeah, I think they kind of feel like a basketball or maybe a bicycle tire. Sometimes people think they're going to be slimy. Uh, reptiles with those scales are not slimy. Things like, can I get you guys over there? You're good over there? Okay. Do you know, you know the, a lot of times we'll ask if, like, none of you admitted to being afraid, although a whole bunch of you actually are. Uh, you know, a lot of times we'll be like, well, why? Why are we afraid of snakes? Uh, and the venomous snake thing usually comes up as a reason. Uh, again, almost impossible to find a venomous snake in Vermont, much less stumble across one by accident. Uh, the way they move, sometimes people will say they don't like the way they move. I don't think that's a very good reason to not like somebody because of the way they move, but, you know, sometimes that's a reason. And they do swim and climb trees, and they don't have feet, so that's weird. Um, the biggest reason I think we're afraid of snakes is we don't eat many real ones. The snakes we meet are in stories and movies. Can you guys think of any movie or story snakes? Are they good guys? No, they're bad guys. We use snakes as the bad guys. Um, and since we're not meeting a lot of real ones, I think it just gets in our head that that's the way it is. Uh, our big snakes, in North America at least, are all helpful snakes. They're rodent eaters. If you have a corn snake in your garden, and they love, that's actually how they got their name, the Native Americans just throw them in the cornfield. Uh, if you have a corn snake in your garden, they're not going to touch the corn, they're not going to touch your fruits and vegetables, they're going to eat the mice and the rats and the chipmunks, that are in there looking to eat what? Your garden, right? Um, if you have a corn or a bilk snake for us, or a corn snake in your barn, they're going to be in there eating the food that you might want to feed your chick, or, or eating the rodents that want to eat the food you're trying to feed your chickens and your cows. Um, my grandfather was really afraid of snakes. I remember as a little kid. Uh, all right, we'll talk about the money. Uh, We all love the bunny. You guys ever think about how tough you have to be to be a bunny? What wants to eat bunnies? Everything. Everything. It eats, it eats bunnies. Now, I did have a kid say, what about a great white shark? And I said, throw a bunny in the ocean. Great white shark will eat. Everybody eats these guys. Um, and still, there are rabbits, aren't there? Yeah. No shoe, there you go. Yeah. Our snowshoe hairs, our big rabbit, our cotton tails are about the same size as this guy. Um, sure. And our rabbits are a little different from those cartoon rabbits or his European ancestors. Our rabbits don't tunnel. So they just got tougher, didn't they? They can't hide down in their tunnel. These little guys are sleeping in the snow. And when an animal comes to eat them, they've got to run. But luckily, rabbits also have a lot of great defenses. Running is one of them. On a sprint, our, most of our rabbits are right around horse speed, about 30, 35 miles an hour. Sneaking up on a rabbit is pretty hard. I mean, look at his eyes. Right now, he can see my shoulders and all of you. Wow. His ears rotate independently. He can listen in two different directions at once. Right now, he's listening in the only direction he can't see. So great line of defense. It's hard to sneak up on these guys. But it's still, a lot of animals survive on rabbits. A lot of critters eat these guys. Um, so that kind of brings us to the rabbit's ultimate defense. Um, there's enough adults in here, I get to use this joke. You guys uh, remember those old Doritos commercials? Eat all you want, we'll just make more. Yeah. That's the rabbit defense. Eat all you want, they'll just make more. Uh, they are very quickly able to replace the rabbits those predators ate. Uh, when, they're le when they're about eight months old, they can have their first litter. If they live someplace nice, you know, maybe a little nicer than here, uh, they might have two or three litters a year. And usually in the wild, that's five or six baby bunnies. Um, at a time? At a time, yeah. Oh, super 
saw. They're adorable little guys. Um, you know, something I, I didn't say, which I should have said, uh, if you folks have questions while we're rolling along here, don't be shy. Go ahead and ask those questions. I mean, maybe do it like school, you know, raise your hand so we don't go into chaos. Sure. Oh, sure, you guys will pet the rabbit. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll come around in the front. I gotta go this way to get out of the There's a question. Yes. Why is the hog nosed snake moving north? Oh, everything's moving north. It's climate, yeah. It's, it's, it's Winters are easier. Summers are hotter, so they're moving there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the thing that stopped them was cold, really. It turns out. Yeah. So they're they're coming up, they're coming up the valley. Alright. I was supposed to be moving faster than I am. Sorry guys. That's alright. We've got another animal here that the rabbit doesn't like very much. We have to keep them separate, they don't get along. Yeah, because turtles are dead. <laughs> so this is a wood turtle, one of Vermont's smartest turtles. That's not usually the measure we hear about, right? But back in the 50s, this guy uh, did all these animal intelligence tests. He wanted to see how smart different animals were, you know, running butterflies through mazes and stuff like that. Um, the wood turtles scored about as well as the rat. That's pretty good. Now in the 80s, let's call them reptile enthusiasts, got a little upset about those tests. They said they weren't fair because they ran those tests at room temperature. Now, a reptile, like a wood turtle, is cold blooded. She can't control her own body temperature. The temperature around her is the temperature of her body. When she's colder, she's slower. When she's warmer, she works better, right? Her heart beats faster, her brain fires better, everything is better. So they redid those same tests at about 80 degrees. And every reptile they tested scored better. Now, they did not run wood turtles through it again, but they ran a red foot tortoise through mazes. And that tortoise was solving those mazes so quickly they thought she was cheating. <laughs> and she probably was. What they thought she was doing was they drop her in the middle of the maze and she'd look up and go, okay. Oh, there's the exit sign. That's the way I want to go. You know, or she was using things she could see to orient on where the exit was. Uh, so they put a roof over the maze so she couldn't see anything. And it did get a lot harder for her. What she ended up doing was she'd walk down one path till she hit a dead end. Then she'd turn around, go all the way back to the middle, go to the next path, follow it till she hit a dead end. All the way back to the middle, the very next path. And she systematically solved the maze. A tortoise. These are animals that, uh, I mean, these are something that we would call a primitive animal, right? Turtles that we would recognize as turtles have been around for over 200 million years. Uh, our snapping turtles walked with dinosaurs. The wood turtle, though, is a little more state of the art. The wood turtle is a new, is on its way to becoming a new type of turtle. Probably the biggest change we see right now, aside from the brain power, is uh, she's a freshwater turtle who eats out of the water. Our other freshwater turtles can't do that. They have to be in the water to eat. Uh, also, when turtles lay their eggs, you guys have all seen that, right? The turtle crossing the road. In Vermont, when you see that, unless it's a wood turtle, pretty much guaranteed that's a girl turtle going to lay her eggs or on her way back to the water. Um, where she lays those eggs will decide if the babies are boys or girls. Did you catch that? Where she lays the eggs. The warmest eggs will be girls. The cooler eggs will be boys. So a lot of times the top of the nest are girls and the bottom of the nest are boys. Wood turtles have moved beyond that. When her eggs are laid, they're boys or girls. Doesn't matter what the temperature is. That is new. That is something our other turtles don't do. Grabbing your hand, that's right, she's very friendly. This turtle actually is, uh, was an illegal pet, 
Uh, in Vermont, there, there's no legal wildlife for pets. You can't have any of our native wildlife. Um, there's a lady up in northern Vermont who was the local turtle lady. Do you have a Bennington turtle lady? No. No? Yeah. Vermont doesn't like the local turtle ladies. Um, but she had, over the years, people just dumping turtles on her, accumulated 16 turtles. Wow. And a few years ago, she realized that she was in her 60s, some of these turtles were going to live another 100 years. And she realized, you know, I need to find a home. So she called the state uh, just to get some advice. And they said, well, what kind of turtles do you have? Uh-huh, uh-huh. The, every turtle you have is an illegal pet. And they came to Buster and seized the turtles. But wait, the story gets happier. Don't worry. Uh, when they got there, the setup she had for these turtles was better than the setup most zoos had. Their summer home was an area almost the size of this room. She planted it full of strawberries and clover and all these plants turtles like to eat. She put a big tree over the top of it. She had two little ponds in there. Awesome turtle habitat. The fish and wildlife guys were like, all right, but what do you do with them in the winter? And she said, oh, I fill my, bar my basement with hay. <laughs> and my basement's full of hay all winter, and that's where the turtles live in the winter. So they were still illegal pets in Vermont, but she didn't get busted. She got some help locating them out of state. This wood turtle, though, as a native species, uh, also a species of special concern in Vermont. They're declining in Vermont. Actually, they're declining throughout their range. Um, they didn't really want to send her off to be someone's pet in New Hampshire, New York, uh, so they asked us to take her. And she's been a really neat turtle to have. Uh, she's so used to people, you can't get her to go into her shell. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, she won't, I mean, she won't go in the shell. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not to say she never has, but she's never done it in a program when I try to make her go in there. She just keeps poking her head back out. Um, and that is sort of a problem wood turtles have. In the wild, when we meet a wild wood turtle, there's a chance they'll do this when you pick them up. We had some kids over in Halifax, Vermont, running around a swamp, and we found two wild wood turtles which blew my mind. I've never found a wild wood turtle running around in the woods. We found two within like five minutes of each other. And so we gathered all the kids up. We picked the turtles up. They both did the boom, hide in their shell. We set them down on the ground. We're all looking at them. And one of them, after about, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds, stuck her head out. Out come the feet, and off she goes, right between the kids. We picked her up again. She kind of pulled most of the way back. Before she was back on the ground, her head was out looking around again. This is not that uncommon for wood turtles. And when people find them, they tend to pick them up and go, this thing is adorable. Nobody would love this. And they take them home. That's a weird threat for American wildlife, to be taken home as a pet. We don't see that with owls. You know, that, that's not the kind of thing that's a, a normal threat to wildlife. It is with the wood turtle. And you can find them all over kind of the northeastern quadrant of the US. Uh, what's that? Oh, they're omnivores. They'll eat anything. Yeah, probably her favorite is strawberry nightcrawler combo. Weird taste combination, but you might try it sometime. All right, here we go. Yeah, we did do it in half an hour. Cool. I felt like we were taking a lot of time. So, well, hold on. He's going to poop on the floor. No, I guess not. He will eventually poop on the floor. Get ready. Get ready with the cameras. So this is the bar. Oh, here he comes. All right. Oh, not a strong reaction. Okay. Uh, so this is the barred owl. This is our most common owl in Vermont. Uh, this bird was hit by a car and blinded in his left eye. Uh, head injury or injuries to owls very often are eye injuries. His eyes are so big, they outweigh his brain. Wow. If I was an owl, my eyes would be the size of grapefruit. <laughs> like, literally, jutting out past the edges of my skull. Most of this head is just feathers. Look at that. Yeah. All feathers. Big fluffy eyes. When your eyes are sticking out past the side of your head and you get clipped by a car or flying to a window or something, those eyes are pretty exposed. Um, barred owls are a bird that we see a lot in captivity because they are pretty common. And really, their, their favorite habitat is kind of a broken habitat. 
forest with lots of little openings, water, they love water, getting in there, catching frogs and salamanders along the edge. Uh, but you think of a highway running through Vermont. That's a little opening in the woods, isn't it? Yeah. So they like those highways. Um, and they tend to get hit by cars a lot. Uh, it's even worse for them than the hawks because they're flying across those highways when? Night. At night, yeah. Owls, for the most part, are nocturnal. They're nighttime animals. Uh, big eyes are great for that, right? Give them good night vision. This bird can fly through the woods by starlight. Uh, which is a pretty cool trick. Uh, owls also have another sense, and in the case of a barred owl, it's better than its eyes. It's sense of hearing. If we we're not supposed to let you pet them, though. Yeah. Um, and really, guys, birds of prey don't really, birds don't really like to be petted all that much. At least birds of prey. You see those videos on YouTube, right? With people like scratching the owl's head. You ever seen those? And they're always like, oh, oh, oh. Do any of you, you kids will know what I'm talking about. When the holidays come around, you see your relatives. Do you have a relative who does that? Hey, sport, how's it going, buddy? Do you have one of those? <laughs> yeah, it, if you do, or if you, you know what I'm talking about, think of the look that's on your face when that happens. It's that same kind of, ah, I love you too, Uncle Jim, right? That's the look on the owl's face, and it's going to be the front page of the paper tomorrow, me making that face. So nice. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, yeah, they're not real touchy-feely kind of animals, even among themselves. Uh, owls are amazing animals. With that hearing, he can hear our heart speak. Or more importantly to him, a barred owl can hear a mouse under the snow, pinpoint that mouse, reach in with those big feet, and ruin that mouse's entire night. Yeah. Now, we talk about hearing, sometimes people question that because animals can hear like that rabbit, right? Big bunny ears coming off their head. Um, instead of one of these, an owl uses its face. Oh, actually, you guys are locals, right, you kids? You guys have four winds, right? Tell me about the owl's hearing. Somebody. No? All right. Did, oh, you can. You know sometimes owls, their ears are behind their eyes? You got it, yeah. Their ears are behind their eyes, kind of down under the feathers there. Absolutely. And how does sound get into those ears? Do you remember Oh, like a bat, that echolocation thing? Almost. It's kind of similar, but, but not quite. What they'll use instead of one of these is that round face. And when you see any owl, the bigger that face is, the more likely it's a hearing-oriented owl. A great horned owl has a little face, it's using its eyeballs. This big round face is a satellite dish. It'll cut those feathers forward, funnel sound into those huge ear holes. Those ear holes are big, right? This pound and a half bird has ear holes almost three times bigger than mine. If I was an owl with my grapefruit eyes, you could put a fist inside my ear hole. Wow. It would be gross, yes, but you could do it. Yeah. That gives this bird that incredible hearing. And some owls, like a barred owl, goes one step further and has crooked ears. One ear's up here, one ear's down there. You look closely at his face, you'll see he has a crooked face, right? The right side's a little bit higher than the left. I think that's the way it goes. Yeah, the right side's a little bit higher to line up with those ears. And that lets the owl triangulate the sound. So it hears that there's a mouse under the snow, but it hears that that mouse is 30 feet ahead of it, a foot under the surface. And it can glide in there, reach in, and bam, dinner time. If you thought this owl was cute when I first brought him out, you know that you are not part mouse. <laughs> this is the scariest thing a mouse will ever dream up. Those senses, those talons pound for pound, an owl is stronger than a hawk. A big owl will eat a big hawk. Uh, they had a, up in Alaska, they had a captive bald eagle. They thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had an eagle and a gray horned owl in the same enclosure? So they put them in together, they watched them all day, everything was cool. They came back the next morning, the eagle was dead. The owl had killed it in the night. Now, during the day, the hawks and the eagles, the falcons, pretty much every bird is faster than an owl. Yeah. Owl feathers are very, very soft. And make sure you pet these feathers. Owl feathers are very soft. That gives them the ability to fly silently. But flying with soft feathers is kind of like fly, paddling with a soft canoe paddle. 
What's going to happen? Yeah, not much, right? Yeah, you're not going to go too far. Uh, so owls are pretty slow flyers. They're not very maneuverable. So we, that's the main reason we don't see them out in the daytime. They just, it's harder for them to catch their food. And it's easy for all those other birds out there to bug them. I mean, one of a chickadee's favorite things is smacking a barred owl in the back of the head. They love this. Uh, crows will bring all their buddies from miles around to beat up an owl. They're actually, I was talking to a, a rehabilitator yesterday. He has a screech owl that came from Bennington a couple days ago. It was getting beat up by crows. That's how the people found it. That's actually a great way to find owls. You find a bunch of crows that are just losing their minds. And in the middle of that, there might be an owl like this. Waiting for it to get dark. Because <laughs> once the lights go out, those crows are in trouble. Uh, most birds have terrible night vision. Uh, that's why we don't see a lot of birds out at night. The owls have a huge advantage. Even though they're slower, the crows can't see them coming in. No questions from you guys. This has been like the most question-free program ever. Uh, thank you very much. No? All right, well, come on up then and check out the deck stuff. Thank you guys very much for coming out today.